Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Gold Coast Central. We are so glad that you are here with us today. I'm currently in midway through, actually more than midway, two-thirds of the way through a very long degree that I'm trying to do part-time whilst I do everything else. And it's through Avondale University and I'm studying theology. And it's amazing and I love it and I just learn so much um, from what I'm studying. And at the moment we're doing something called family systems. And it's a really beautiful subject that looks at how we can support one another and how people in ministry can relate to the needs of their congregation. And one of the statements that our lecturer, who's someone you probably are familiar with, a lot of people, Trafford Fisher, said that church is a family of families. And when I think about that, that just really fills me up. Because my family are the people that I love. Yes, they drive me crazy sometimes, but I love spending time with my family. And not just my immediate family of Mike and the kids, but also my extended family. And this last weekend, on Sunday, I got up way too early, like about half past three in the morning, drove to the airport by five, hopped on a plane by six, flew to Sydney, met both of my brothers who flew from Melbourne jumped in a car, drove three and a half hours north, all to surprise my mum for her 70th birthday. She had no idea that we were coming. And I'd whispered in the ear of one of her friends to kind of be our co-conspirator. And so she had mum at a restaurant, just at a cafe, a fish and chip place in Foster. And we were able to sneak up, tap her on the shoulder and just say, is this seat taken? And of course, her answer is, first of all, she squealed and then she cried and then it's like, come and sit down. And that's what we want church to be. We want church to be the place where there's always a seat for you. It's a place no matter what family you come from. You might be from, you know, the family with mum, dad and 2.5 kids. Or maybe you're a single parent. Or maybe you're a widower. Or maybe... You're someone who's single and perfectly happy being single and your family is you and friends who are your family and the cat and the dog. Maybe you're someone who's longing for a partner and just haven't found that person yet. Families come in so many different ways, but we are a family of families. And because of that, we want to welcome you to our family today. We want you to know there is a seat for you. You are welcome here anytime. And we hope that as you walk through these doors, you will feel like that you have come home. And for those people who are watching online, we hope that this is your online home. Because church is not this place, this building. Church is you. And instead of saying, I'm going to church, I feel like we should be saying, I'm going to be the church today. So today as part of our program, we just want to invite you to join in, participate with your heart, with your singing, with your mind, and that today you can be the church because we are a family of families. And that only works because our Redeemer still lives. Yes, we are part of the great family of God. We have a Redeemer who has redeemed us so that we could be part of the family of heaven. And that's where we're going to be one day. Until then, we're going to be in this world praising him. I'd like to invite you to stand with us now. We're going to sing about our living redeemer in a world that sometimes seems like it's gone completely insane. It's good to know that our redeemer is alive.
Thomas, you're welcome to sit down. He staggers up. Hello, church. Nice to see you here today. We're so glad to be here praising our Redeemer. Um, and I love the way Karen just brings in the family because, you know, we've been here. This is our seventh year. And, you know, that, that creates deep, close relationships. And it also creates sometimes some, some relationships, you know, because relationships can be messy. And sometimes we maybe don't see eye to eye. But, you know, we work through those things and we still love each other. And I, I love that about our church family because, you know, church families all have difficulties you have to work through. But we don't go separate ways and stop being family. And we're all part of God's family. Now, we got some exciting news. If you haven't heard, uh, our big mi business meeting happened on Monday night. Uh, we had a nice turnout, and we went out. And uh, the first thing we did is we read a bit of scripture, and we went out into the space just outside of Auditorium 2 and made a circle. And we prayed around that space where, if it's meant to be, we just prayed God would bless that that building would be a place where our young people could come and learn about Jesus and we could spread the gospel. And we went back and we looked at all the facts and we presented everything to the meeting. And um, of the 33 people that voted, um, 32, I think, were yeses. There was one that abstained. You know, it's interesting. Three years ago, we originally voted on this. It was the exact same thing. Everyone was yes. There was one abstained. And I thought, well, that's a very strong um, move. You know, we're, we're together with this as a church. And a building project can be a positive thing. It can be a thing that just drives the church, or we can have it bog us down. And it's going to bog us down if we focus on the building and, and all the finances. You know, the 200000 more is going to cost us. That can be a bit, oh, heavy. But if we look at the church and how God's working in our lives, the people here, the people God's bringing to us, then, you know, this God, God is I shared on Monday night in Psalms 50. It says he's uh, the owner of a, a cattle on a thousand hills. You know, this is David's way of describing how God is his wealth is beyond what we can comprehend. And um, so I'm just so excited. I think we have some uh, plans. I just want to scroll through. Some people haven't seen them. We'll try to get access so you can look on our website and see our plans. If you haven't seen these plans, they've been around for about three years, but many haven't seen them. And I would just, uh, just quickly, you know, this is a, the shaded area is a thing that's going to almost increase the um, square footage because it's two stories. This new building, almost another third, I think it's going to add to our whole square footage of our building. So just scroll, keep going. We're just going to take a few minutes. This is the, the different angles from the front and the side and from the street view of, of the building. And I think there's one more to show where the actual classroom. So we're going to have big, three big classrooms to fit all the young people. And many of our young people are away today because we have a youth rally happening up on the north side. But, um, you know, we still have lots of young people even when the young people are away. And we're just so excited about how God's going to use this new building to help us to spread the gospel and to provide a space for our young families and our young people. So as, as we move on from this, I just want to encourage us to really all be faithful. And I had one thing I wanted to show you that came in the mail this week. And I got it out of the mailbox here at church. And I thought, oh, this is just, you know, you get some interesting things in the mail. And I didn't think much of it. And I just had it laying there at home and to the Seventh-day Adventist church. But then, then yesterday I looked at it. It says actually tithe above it. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so I opened the envelope up, and it's actually a tithe envelope in there. Now, I'm not going to share who it's from. But... You know, this person, I think, they, I think there's cash. I haven't opened it, but I'm pretty sure they have. But they, they put their cash in the envelope and posted it. But I just wanted to share, you know, to me, I know this person quite well. But this person is, a, is an older person, lives in um, a, a retirement place. They, um, uh, yet they are faithful. And not only have they paid their tithe, they put money towards the church budget, they put money to ADRA, and they put money towards our new equipment that we're trying to raise money for. And I just thought, you know, that is amazing. That, to me, that's a picture of faithfulness. 
someone that's you know hasn't been able to come to church recently because of some of the challenges with uh, them living in a retirement village and with um, COVID and things. Yet they're continually to be faithful. And, and we've got many people I know that are faithful. And I just want to challenge you to think about how you're giving back to God. Ultimately, it all belongs to Him. But, you know, if He, he says that if we are faithful in our tithes and our offerings, that, um, you know, he, he will fill up our lives with all our needs and, and more. And um, I don't want to preach a prosperity gospel because I'm not going to say you're going to be, be rich and never need anything. But God will provide for your needs. And so I just really want, as we face this building project, we still got to conclude, we want to replace these speakers. And we're about a little over 20,000 still short of our goal to con complete our equipment upgrade. And I'd really like to see us do this um, before we get too far into this new building project, because that's going to be a big focus paying that off. But you know, these speakers, you know, why do we need to replace them? Well, we have said before, they're 13 years old. They were put in this auditorium when there was just a piano and an organ in this church. Uh, they're not, um, as, as professionals tell me, they're not the right speakers for a band and the sort of music we're using in church now. Uh, other churches that hire our place don't even use these speakers. They bring their own because they, they just they, they don't provide the sound that they want that's a nice sound. So anyway, that's um, just a bit of a plug for that. I want to encourage you to be faithful in your giving. But also wanna, another thing I want to share today is to be faithful in your time. Because, I mean, we want to give back to God in our money, but also in our time. And I have a bit of a scary thing. We had our op shop committee meeting this week. Now, some of you, oh, you got an op shop? Yes, we do. We have Ad Care Shop in South Portland. It's been going for about 26 or more years. And this shop has provided thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to help community projects and charities for many, many years. That op shop, we actually, when I came to this church um, a little over six years ago, there was two op shops. And we closed the other one because you got to get volunteers for both. But that second op shop, the whole purpose of it was to pay off this building. And just after I came, I think this building was totally paid off. And, you know, people and the members here and people that come to church were faithful in giving, but also the op shop contributed a lot to paying off that building. So the op shop is a great thing. Now, our op shop now, we only have one, but they told me, hey, at the committee meeting this week, it looks like we're, we might have to close the op shop. And I, I just, you know, I, I was quite, this op shop gives over $20,000 to us as a church to use in a community every year. That's just us. They give another um, 20 plus thousand to other charities around the Gold Coast. And it all relies on people who volunteer and give their time. And we're not getting them. And our manager there, Agnieszka, is um, not able to carry on. And I'm just going to have Agnieszka, I don't think she'll come up the front, but would you stand up, please, Agnieszka? And her husband, Mick, both of you, would you guys stand up? We don't see you often, but we just thank you. Thank you for, um, you know, I think she said, I think it's 15 years she's been managing the shop. And um, if you can't remember Ag Agnieszka, I think you can just call her Anna. And um, it took me a while to get my tongue around Agnieszka. I think I do it all right now. But Agnieszka manages that shop. She's also looking for someone to rel relieve her and um, on a Monday and a Friday, and that's been advertised as well. So, and that will be a paid position if you're someone that uh, was able to give up two days a week and be an assistant manager of that shop. You need to see Agnieszka, uh, the, her number's in the bulletin, or you can see myself, and um, we can make sure that you get connected. But we rely on volunteers, and as I look around, there's quite a few of you that give every week. But if you're able just to do three hours in the morning or afternoon, one day a week, if we had four or five people that could do that, it would save our shop from closing. But see, come July, we've got to sign a new lease. And we can't go signing a lease if we can't keep the shop open because that's going to be a big, bad financial decision. So uh, I'd love to see our shop stay open. So this is a very urgent plea out there. If you could give three hours a week, please um, uh, see our op shop at the Ad Care Shop in Southport, uh, and we will keep that shop going. 
Um, another thing that we're excited about with our model here in church is one of the things we want you to be part of our church and to grow into why we exist and be involved. And uh, one of the ways you do that is go through our growth track. And so Greg's um, heading up, leading people through the growth track this year, Greg Pratt. And um, there's a couple of opportunities I want to just share with you. On Tuesday night, this, starting this week at 7 p.m., this will be on Zoom. So you can stay in your own home and just go over. I think it's going to be three nights on Zoom, and you'll go through the growth track. Okay, so that's one opportunity. If you want to do it in person, starting this Friday night at the Pratt's house, and they'll provide you with a meal as well, you can come along and do a, uh, a full course. So you'll go through the whole growth track in one night. It'll start at 6 p.m. and, um, and, and do a, a fast course of that. But we really want to encourage everyone, whether you've been a member a long time or not, to go through the growth track, because the growth track really helps you to see why we exist. It helps you to discover, you know, how God's wired you, how you can contribute and serve where your passions and your gifts are at. And now next, I just want to really share something. Why we exist as a church is to lead people to Jesus Christ. And I just want to invite young Jaden Pratt up. Now, Jaden Pratt, um, you know, we've been in this church, as I've said already, for over six years, and Jaden... I think, are you 11, Jaden? Yep. So, you know, he was about five. I think him and, and he's in the same grade as Hannah, my daughter. And they, um, you know, I think they were in prep my, when I first moved here. And now he's just turning into a, a fine young man in grade six. And he has um, been studying with me through the years. His dad, of course, is a pastor. But, um, you know, he really loves Jesus. And, and uh, I love the fact that he has made a decision that this afternoon, Jaden's going to get baptized. We're so happy for you, Jaden, and we're glad. Put your hands together for Jaden. And Jaden, I'm just going to have you share. Can you just tell us a little bit why you've decided to be baptized? Um, because I kind of wanted to be part of our church, and like, I wanted to be part of the God's family. Beautiful, beautiful. And... Jay, do you have something that really inspires you, other than your father and, and of course, your pastor? Um, but is there someone maybe in the Bible, is there a character that particularly has inspired you as you've grown to come to this point? Joseph. Uh, yeah, that's a hard one to get past. Yeah, Joseph's a, a real inspiration. Had his ups and downs, but he kept faithful, didn't he? Yeah, lovely. And do you have a, a favorite verse or something that really um, you'd like to share with everyone today? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Yeah, and listen, whatever you're facing, what a great promise that is. You can always cling to that because we're all going through good times and bad times, hard times. We've seen plenty of them recently and even today. You know, there's people without homes and still cleaning up flooded houses. And, you know, God's with them as well. And um, that's wonderful, Jaden. We're so proud of you. I'm so glad that you're making this decision today. Um, it is this afternoon down south of the border. The information's in the bulletin if you want to. I want to just um, share the vows. As, as baptism in our church, you, you, you're baptizing to Jesus, accepting his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So you're being born again as a Christian. That's what baptism's all about, water baptism. And we believe that that's very biblical. Jesus himself was baptized by immersion. So this afternoon... You're going to be baptized by immersion, but you're also becoming a member of our church. And I love the fact that you're excited about being part of our church family. What a great thing. Because some people, oh, I want to get baptized, but I don't want to be part of the church. And, and listen, I think if you look at the Bible, it talks about the church and the body of Christ, and that we need to come together because we're all different parts. And Jaden, you're part of that body, and by coming and being part of the church, you help to make the, the church complete. And that includes everyone here, and we, we value you, whether you're young or old, because it's all of us together that makes the body complete, and we're able to really do the work God's called us to do. So to join the church, we have three vows. So you're getting married in a way to Jesus, and this is a, a lifetime commitment. This partner never lets you down, okay? He was always solid as a rock. And um, so that's great. And so the three vows that you're going to make in this commitment today is first, do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord and do you desire to live your life in a saving relationship with him? Yes. Awesome. 
And the second one says, do you accept the teachings of the Bible as expressed in the statement of fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And do you pledge by God's grace to live your life in harmony with these teachings? Yes. Awesome. And lastly, do you desire to be baptized as a public expression of your belief in Jesus Christ, to be accepted into the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, to support the church and its mission as a faithful steward by your personal influence, your tithes and offerings, and your life of service? Yes. That is awesome, Jade. Can you guys just put your hands together once again to welcome into our church? So, subject to his baptism uh, this afternoon at 4 p.m., he will. It will all be complete. But um, we want to go ahead and just give you. Um, this is a, a discipleship kit we give everyone that gets baptized, and a, just a card from the church. And we look forward to celebrating with you this afternoon. God bless you, Jaden. Thanks for, for your decision. God bless you. Thanks for letting me share. church. It's really wonderful to be home and this is home. Peter and I have been away for the last two weeks um, up at Noosa to his sister's home where the family gathered around to have time to say goodbye to his mum. It was a painful time but there was so many blessings and answers to prayer as we gathered around her. It was such a blessing with the timing because two, Peter's the oldest of seven and two of these family members were overseas and now because the borders were open, we're able to be together as a family with ten around her bed um, for many hours in the middle of their lounge room floor and that was a blessing too because there's no room in the hospital. And so just the way we had prayed, it ended up at home and the family prayed, six of around the bed prayed, and many of those don't pray before, don't normally pray. But the thing is, too, touch was such an important part. As we stroked her head, we held her hand, we held her ankle, any part of her as we were around the bed, as we told her how much we loved her. And it was just a beautiful family time. So family's important. And now, isn't it great that we're part of God's family and that God is our Father and we can pray to him now. So please join me in prayer. Our dear Father, we want to thank you so much for your love for each one of us. We want to thank you so much, dear Father, that you have sent your son that we can be part of your family, that he died for us, that we can have assurance of salvation. Thank you, dear Father, that you care about each one of us, that you know the heartaches we go through, you know the struggles we go through, you know the times that we might doubt, that we might fear, and that you're there to put your loving arms around us. Thank you for your many promises in your word. Thank you, dear Father, that with you there is no social distancing. You made us to touch. You made us to care. 
You made us, dear Father, with that ability to love each other and to be there in a loving way for each other as part of your family. We grieve, dear Father, for the families that are both in our country suffering from the floods. Some are still getting over the fires from last year, but now we have floods that so many are homeless or struggling in so many ways. And we think of our families over in Ukraine and Russia. So many of them are just are so, um, so left homeless, frightened, fearful, grieving and struggling to understand why. We pray, dear Father, for your miraculous intervention to help save lives. And we pray, dear Father, that we will trust you. Thank you that you're in charge of our future. Thank you that you're, you are with us as we reach out to our community to draw them into a loving relationship with you. Thank you, dear Father, that you have your arms around us as individuals. And we look forward to the time that we're going to be reunited as a big family in heaven we know that this world um, is sick and suffering, but we look forward to that day. It gives us so much hope. So thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we would. this morning's offering is for um, our local church budget, and we know that there's many blessings of being part of our church family. And we just pray that as the deacons come forward, that will take up this, um, ask them to come forward now and we take up this offering. But I want to pray that God will bless it. Dear Father, we just pray that you will bless this offering, Lord, that you'll multiply it and that it's small tokens of our appreciation. But we know in your hands, dear Father, the work can go forward in this church in the men and ministries. So I pray, dear Father, that you'll reach each heart now as they'll bring up the offering. And I pray, dear Father, that you'll please be with Pastor Matt too as he brings the word that you've laid on his heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, kids, I know you're there. I know you're probably down underneath the back of the seats, but I need some helpers. So if you would like to come down the front, I have got a story to tell you today. Oh, Kobe's coming and Vivi and Liam's here and Hannah's here. Awesome. See, just when you think there are no kids, because you look around and you can't see any, there's like a whole bunch of them. Yes, bring the big kids down too. I like it. Whether they want to or not. Okay. I need a helper. Hmm. So many people are fabulous helpers, but I'm going to choose Jazzy. Okay, Jazzy, come up here for me. Hmm. I'm going to need you to hold my microphone because... I am going to blindfold you. But while I'm doing that, I want you to tell everyone your name and how old you are. My name's, ja My name's Jasmine and I'm turning 11 in June, but I'm currently 10. But almost 11, yes. Can you see anything? No. That's okay, so Jazzy, just stand here for me. I am going to grab something out of my little bag of tricks here and I'm going to get Jasmine to put her hands out in front of her, turn over this way. I'm going to put something in your hands and then I'm going to ask you to see if you can describe what it is. Okay, you ready? Oh, I hope it's not too scary. Oh, here we go. Don't say what it is. Okay, you ready? Right, have a feel of that. Oops, let me get rid of that. Okay, what do you think that is? Ooh. It feels slimy. That would be true. It, it's goggles. It's like goggles. 
goggles. Is she right? Yes. yes. Okay, keep your blindfold on. Well done. Goggles. Feel slimy. Hmm, they are my children's goggles. <laughs> that is highly likely that they are slimy. Apologies, Jess. Okay, next one. You ready? Don't jump when I put this one in your hand. Uh, it's spiky. Feels like my dad's massage ball. Your dad has excellent taste. This is not your dad's massage ball, but it is mine. So, yes, you are correct. You can see how it's got the nice little bumpy bits on it. Okay. Next one. This one's a bit trickier. wonder if she'll be able to work this one out. Oh, uh, feels like a A or a triangle. An A. That's a pretty good... Yeah, yeah, okay. What I want you to do is I want you to grab the end here and I want you to... Oh, it's the thing that you put on your clothes to make it stick. You clearly hang out washing all the time with an answer like that. A clothes peg. Yes, you're right. Okay. I've got another one for you. I hope you're strong. You ready? Don't drop it. Oh, wait, lift the thing. Yeah, you're right. It's a weight. You are correct. And yes, that's kind of how I look when I do it. And they're the baby ones, just in case you were wondering. Okay, last one. You ready? This one's going to be a little bit trickier because I don't know if you're going to know what this is. A cap thing? Like a swimming cap? Yeah. Wait, what? It's so long. <laughs> it's rubbery. A rubber blindfold? Okay, you can take your blindfold off. You can see I raid, raided my exercise equipment this morning. This is like a stretchy exercise thing, but you're right, it's the same kind of material as a swimming cap. Right, give Jazzy a clap. Now, Jazz, how did you know? You were blindfolded. You couldn't see. How on earth did you work out all those things? By touch. Oh, wow. Imagine that. You're right. So it was touch. Touch is one of our senses that is really, really important. And we learn a lot about the world by touching things. And there are some things we shouldn't touch. Who's ever been stung by a bee? Yeah, no, that's not a good touch. That doesn't feel good. But God made us. So touch is very important to us. I want to show you a picture now up on the screen of two babies. Now, these are twins that were born in America just a couple of months ago. And the little one, his name is Deanna, and the baby at the top, his name is Dylan. Now, those babies were so teeny tiny when they were born that they actually weighed less than my weight here. They were born 15 weeks early, and they weighed 700 grams, one of them, which is about... You know your tub of margarine or butter that you have that you put on your toast? About that size, maybe a bit less. And the other one was 900 grams. Now, because they were born so early, they didn't know how to breathe by themselves yet. So they had to be taken to a bigger hospital than where they were born at. And the doctors and nurses worked on them and they put special breathing things on them and they, they helped them, their lungs, to be able to breathe properly. Well, Dylan the bigger baby, he got a bit better. So they moved him back to the other hospital, which sometimes happens when you have twins, they end up in two different places. And that was away from his brother, Dianel. Well, something terrible started to happen. Dianel's breathing started to get really slow. The level of oxygen in his blood started to drop and you need oxygen to stay alive and to breathe. And they rang Dylan and Deanna's parents and said, we think you need to come and say goodbye to Dylan because we think he's going to die. Sorry, to Deanna because Deanna is so little and his lungs are so sick. So they brought Dylan in from the other hospital to say goodbye. And they put Dylan in the same humidity crib, the little bed that the baby was in, that little sick Deanna was in, they put him right next to his brother. And Dianel 
was the sick baby. Remember that? They thought he was going to die. He had Dylan next to him. Dylan put his arm around his twin brother. And as he did that, his oxygen levels started to rise. His breathing started to improve. And the nurses and doctors went, well, that's a little bit strange. Maybe it was just a coincidence. And, and Deanna was still very sick. So then they took Dylan out of the same bed. And what do you think happened? Deanna's oxygen levels started to drop again. A hug from Dylan saved his little brother or his twin brother. He was little in size. And they kept them together in the same bed until Deanna was well enough to go home. And they went from thinking that they were going to say goodbye to their baby to being able to take two healthy babies home, all because of the power of a hug. So today, I want you to think how you can bless someone through touching them in a way that's really nice, holding their hand, putting an arm around their shoulder. You've always got to make sure it's okay with the other person. I'm pretty sure your mums and dads are fine with that. So they're a good person to try this on. And go up and give them a hug. And you might not save somebody's life like Dylan did for Deanna, but you might be a blessing to them and make their day better. Thank you, everybody. You can go back to your seats. As we get ready to sing more worship songs, I'd like to read some verses for you out of 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I'd like to invite you to stand and sing with us now. We're going to start to praise the Lord for the power of his love, his goodness and his kindness to us. Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I
love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. So my life you have been faithful. the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. Oh, I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. your goodness that leads us to repentance please work in our hearts and our minds to see and understand and perceive your goodness as how it touches every area of our lives in jesus name amen how are we going Am I going? Yes. It's good to see you. How are we feeling? Good? How's God? Is he pretty good? Yeah, he is. He's great, isn't he? It's great to be with you all this morning. Um, we're going through a series, if you don't know, what's it called? Flow. Like a delayed... Thank you, Dan. Appreciate that. <laughs> it's flow, that's right. And last week we started off with Pastor Mike. He launched it very well and he talked about acts of service. And is one way of, uh, of, be, of sharing love with people. Now, we're talking about five love, five love languages. And it's based on the book, which you may have heard of, by Gary Chapman. It's been around for 25 years, was it? I think it was. Yeah, it's been around for a while. But if you haven't yet read the book, I'd encourage you to give it a go. If you haven't yet done the quiz, you've got no excuse. Because we've, we've already suggested it to you. And we'll put the website up there, up there for you to jot down if you want to give it a go, take a photo or something. 
Um, it's an easy quiz. My, my, my wife, I did it, our kids did it as well. And we got to talk about the different love languages that we have. Um, next slide, I think mine's up there. Yeah, there's mine. My primary love language is... Do you know what the topic today is? It's rigged. <laughs> my love language, my primary love language is physical touch. The second one with 30% is quality time. The third one on 20% is words of affirmation. Uh, the fourth one on 70% is... Uh, is acts of service, is it? I knew that. And the one on 0% is giving gifts, which I'm really pleased about. <laughs> so poor Heidi. <laughs> Heidi, Heidi's one is zero percent on gifts as well, so it's working out. <laughs> now, I'd like to think that's a good that's a good excuse for me not to give gifts, but I'm not very good at it. But uh, yeah, she still likes them every now and then. It's, I think she still appreciates. So not quite zero percent, maybe it's a bit higher than that. But anyway, there it is. So that's my that's my result. So it's 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 a good simple test. Give it a go. It's a good conversation starter with your family, with your friends, and with um, anyone who else has done it. So. For example, if I asked you today, does anyone know if their gift is physical touch? Is, is your, if your dominant way of giving uh, love is physical touch? Does anyone know that? You've got a few people? Okay, that's good. That's, um, it's definitely mine. And I was really, really excited when, um, when lockdown beca became less of an issue and the mask slowly came off. And, and uh, I, think I, I think I managed to get a hug from Bridget, wherever she is. Is she here? There she is. That was good. That was really good. Um, so yeah, lot to, uh, touches of one today. Now, if you don't remember anything from, from Pastor Mike's sermon last week, I'm sure you remember the love tank. You remember that, the, the bowl? And um, if, if all you remember from last week is that his bad shot with his minties, then that, you probably need to go back and look at his sermon again because there's more to it than that, but I remember that very well. He was talking about how, you know, there are different ways that you can feel, I think Karen's love tank was, tank was what you're talking about. And some of them don't necessarily do as well because they're not necessarily what he's wired, how he's wired to be. Now, I normally hate quizzes. This one worked really well. I normally like to think there's a third or a fourth answer. Um, if, I'm always bad multi-choice. If they give me A, B, C, D, I like to think there's an E. But, but this quiz was actually quite good. Now, some people, when I say the word touch, will get a bit, uh, get a bit sensitive and a bit, a bit nervous, and I understand that. Um, today's world, touch is a very, it's not, it wasn't meant to be a pun, but the word that comes to mind is a very touchy subject. Um, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a weird one because there's obviously a lot of people who take the beautiful gift which touch is and, and twist it and make it very, very abusive and very, um, and very messy. So... Inappropriate touch, we talk a lot about that today, don't we? And rightly so, because it's not, it's not right to be doing that kind of thing. So it's very appropriate to talk about inappropriate touch. Um, it's very important to talk about what, how people should not touch you and things like that. That's very important. But there's a reason that that kind of stuff is going on right now, because it's based on a beautiful gift. When physical touch is done appropriately, it's a very powerful thing. And we're going to share a story in the Bible today that talks about that. So I want to acknowledge that, yes, yeah, some, some people here will be thinking, I don't, I'm very uncomfortable with that. And there might be, might be history to that, might be a story in your life which, which, which speaks to that. And, um, of course, I'm more than happy to share that story with you sometime if you want to share it with me or any of, any of our leaders. But, um, but it's still important to talk about the, the gift that that thing is based on. So we're going to do that today. Touch is important in my family. There's some pictures of, uh, yep, me. And um, there's my dad in the middle. That was back in the 80s. That's why he's got that weird hairdo and the beard. Um, I, think he, I think he's hanging on to the 70s a bit longer than he should have. There's me and my daughter. Uh, me and my daughter. Me and my sister on the bottom left hand picture. How many, how many kids or how many people have that memory of sharing stories with your parents? Just sitting down and then reading to you. Yeah, it's very important to read to, to your kids. Up the top, le top left is my favorite. Um, we're both wearing towels. I don't, I want, don't, want, to, don't want to know why. There's probably, I guess we had a bath, I don't know. And there on the top right is my grandfather. He passed away a few years ago. We really miss him. He was, he was very close to us. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to get something out of his mouth, I guess. So touch is pretty important. And down the bottom right, I don't even know who that is. But that's okay. It's probably my mum or something like that. 
<laughs> anyway, so I got, my, I got my parents to find these pictures because they're, they're important pictures to me. Touch is important in our families. Um, I'm sure we've all heard the stories, or the stories of the experiments that, uh, which weren't very ethically good, but they still did them in Russia with, um, you know, the one where they, they had some babies and they, did, they didn't touch them. They fed them, they clothed them, they gave them shelter and everything, but they didn't touch them, they didn't hug them, they didn't anything like that. And they, did, they had another group of babies where they gave them all the same stuff and they did touch them, hug them, and things like that. And the second group fared very well, the first group not so well at all. So touch is an important thing. Um, Karen talked about the healing power of touch as well. Now kids, uh, you, you had a great kid story. I wonder if you can think of how many different types of positive touch you know of. Like, if you could think of touching, maybe punching is not a good one, for example. So that's a negative one. Can we think of any positive ones? And just yell it out, I'll have to repeat it for our friends online, but if you can think of any positive ways that you touch somebody, can are there, any of the kids want to yell out what that would be? What's a positive way you touch somebody? What's, what's a positive form of touch? Maybe think of your siblings or your friends. Sorry? Hugs. Hugs are made in heaven, they say. Yeah, hugs are great. Hugs is a good one. Anyone else? Any good ways you can touch somebody? What? Yeah, yeah, actually, touching or holding hands, depending on who you're with, is a good way of praying together. Laying hands on people's good. Yeah, you, you up there? Patting Sorry? Patting yes, patting them. We're talking about your pet dog or your brother or your sister. Either way, it works. Sometimes the kids will come up and pat you on the head and you're like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a good, that can be a good one too. Anyone else? Let's take one more. Yeah, we heard kiss. That's a good. That's a really good one. Yeah, that's a really good one. So there are all kinds of ways we touch people. Now, the yeah, I came across this term when I was when I was researching this um, sermon, and I, it came up with this term called skin hunger. It's a very visual picture. I never heard about it before, and um, you can probably guess what it means. It's basically it's a condition where um, someone is de desperately needing. Contact, physical, physical contact, and they're not getting it. And uh, it's like some psychologists and, and other people like that have coined, have coined this term called skin hunger. This person has skin hunger. They've not been touched enough in their lives. They're, they're, they're feeling cut off, and their health is deteriorating because of it. It's quite a, quite a sobering thought. Skin hunger is a biological need for human touch. There's a quote here from um, a couple of, a couple of uh, researchers which says, it's why babies in neonatal intensive care units are placed on their parents' naked chests. It's the reason that prisoners in solitary confinement often report craving human contact as ferociously as they desire their liberty. It's also why three months into lockdown, this is a, bit, a little while back, many of us may feel increasingly tearful, low or flat, because we've not had that contact. And this, is, this has come up, of course, with, with lockdown, the, the, the inability to touch um, people we love. And you can take it for granted until it's taken away from you, can't you? Touch in different countries. Touch is a universal language, but every culture has its own way of speaking it. Now, I've, 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 there's only a small sample here I've got of different countries and different ways people touch each other. You probably think of, more, think of a few more. In North Africa and the Middle East, you find men join their hands together in greeting. And in fact, in a lot of African countries, um, men who are just, just, just friends, nothing more, they walk around holding hands, which is quite strange for us in, uh, in the de uh, developed Western countries. Um, the Congolese would touch each other on the temples and kiss foreheads. In Tuvalu, they sniff each other's cheeks. The a Andaman Islanders, I look, you, should, you should look these guys up, they're really interesting. They're one of the last, one of the last um, un unexplored groups, effectively, of, of, of native people. They live in uh, th these islands in the Bay of Bengal. And they're only just now starting to be contacted by people, and they're facing all kinds of trouble with tourism and exploitation and stuff like that. But they will, they will sit in each other's laps, and then when they farewell each other, they lift the other person's hand to their mouth and blow. I don't know what it looks like. That's all, that's all that they said. Britain, historically, has been a low-contact culture. Now, you think of the British, you often think of this, you know, upper, stiff upper lip, they don't, they don't uh, interact very much, and that is the stereotypical picture of them. Um, it's, it was interesting reading how one explanation for the rise of the popularity of ballroom dancing um, a couple of centuries ago was that it gave the shy strangers formal permission to hold each other all night long. 
that was one of the few socially acceptable times when people from opposite sexes could touch each other. Interesting concept. Um, so, yeah, touch is really important. And, of course, it's the type of thing which you may have experienced, uh, hopefully you've all experienced it positively, um, but you may have also had the challenge of facing uh, to touch, which is not appropriate, and also maybe not being touched at all, which is, which is a really sad situation. Um, in 1966, a psychologist, Sidney Girard, conducted a field study of couples sitting in coffee shops around the world. He found that in the Puerto Rico capital, San Juan, couples touch each other by hand-holding, backstroking, knee-patting, whatever, an average of 180 times an hour. In Paris, it was 110 times. In Florida, it was twice. You, you, won't, you never lived in Florida, did you? Okay. In London, never. So this is in 1966. It's, it's, I understand it's changing quite a, quite a bit now because the culture in, in uh, England is changing, so it's more, more interaction, which is great. But interesting um, spread, isn't there, of different types of touch. Now, in Australia, what are we known for? Do you have any way we... any cultural way that we touch each other? It's a bit of a tricky question because we're fairly multicultural as well, but... Yeah, good one, Karen. Do it a bit more aggressively. <laughs> Yeah, you punch him. The more you like someone, the more hard you punch him. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> General, generally, it's amongst blokes, but I guess the, the girls have a go too. Any, anyone else? Can you think? If you think Australians, can you think of one way that they will involve touch in their culture? Handshake. Sorry. Yeah, handshakes are very common. Yep, that's that's a very important one. High five. That works. Yep. Pat on the back. On the back or slap on the back. <laughs> Going with Karen's one. Um, Hugging, yeah, that's good. I, I was trying to work out NRL. I was a bit confused about this one. Um, do, do the guys do NRL because they like to be touched or they don't? Because they get touched all the time, but they, the game is to try and avoid being touched. I don't know. Work that one out. I'm suspicious that the guys who, who play these kind of games enjoy the um, camaraderie of touch. Just watch the scrum. That basically sums it up. Anyway. We've got a story from the Bible which we're going to look at now. Um, where's our readers? Where'd you go? There you are. Hannah and Jaden are going to read for us a story from the Bible found in Luke chapter 8. So let's listen to this and then we're going to talk about it a bit. This is a reader's letter from Luke 8 verse 40 to 48 called The Woman Healed. As Jesus went... The crowds pressed in on him. Now there was a woman. A woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages. From bleeding. For twelve. Twelve? Twelve, twelve years. years. And although she had spent all she had on doctors. Everything. Every last cent. No one could cure her. She came up behind Jesus. Right behind him. And touched the fringe of his clothes. And immediately. Straight away. That very second. The bleeding, the bleeding stopped. stopped. Then Jesus asked, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. Someone touched him. For I noticed that the power had gone out from me. When the, mo when the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, even though she tried, she came trembling and shaking and quivering. Falling down before him, she declared in the presence of all the people, in front of everyone, why she had touched him, and how she had immediately, instantly, in that very moment, healed. Jesus said to her, he said to this woman, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in peace. Go in peace. Yeah, it's a powerful story, this one. Um, a lady here for 12 years, yeah, they emphasise that 12 years is a long time. Think about being in lockdown for that kind of period of time. Um, we have a trouble with only one or two or three years, whatever it might be, but 12 years is a significant portion of this lady's life. And not just being, not just suffering the pain, which is one thing, 
and the disease, whatever it was, or the illness. But imagine having the stigma of not being able to be touched. Um, if you look at Leviticus 15, is it up yet? Yeah, it was a bit later. Yeah, look at Leviticus 15, verses 25, 27. This is from this is from this lady's Bible. She didn't have the New Testament, obviously she was part of the New Testament, but from her Bible, it had these words to say, if a woman has a flow of blood for many years, the woman will be unclean. If any of you touch these things, yeah, you'll be ceremonially unclean. When the woman's bleeding stops, she must count off seven days, then she'll be ceremonially unclean. And it says, goes on to say, you can go to the temple and show yourself to the priest. So being unclean meant you weren't touched. Um, there's all kinds of stigmas attached to that, which is, which is pretty, pretty sad, pretty tough, but we can't, don't have time to go into that today. Rest assured, though, the problem is this lady is constantly unclean. She's got a, a blood, an issue of bleeding, which is constantly going 12, 12 years, and she can't get out and touch anybody, can't have them touch her, because that makes them unclean, which means they don't go to church. And, and imagine the kind of stigma that that would have. Imagine her picture of God through all this. I can't go to church. Not allowed to go to church. What was, what's that about? What would, she think, what, what would she be thinking about God in that kind of situation, I wonder? Um, so she's not touched by anyone. She's not appreciated. Uh, she thinks that God has abandoned her, effectively, I would suggest. And that's a tough, really tough situation. There's no words to describe what it would be like. Jesus comes along. And he comes along and he's, he's approached by a man named Jairus. He's a synagogue ruler and he's one of, the, one of the leaders in the town. And Jairus comes to him and says, my, my daughter is sick, can you please come and heal her? Jesus says, sure, I'll go. And he starts off. Now, of course, this lady hears, I don't know how she hears, there must be someone in her life who's, who's looking out for her, which is great. Someone in her life which converses with her and, and keeps her up to date with, with what is going on. And I, I imagine in my mind that this lady has a friend who comes and gives her food and chats to her and says, Do you, have you heard about Jesus? He, he's pretty amazing. He's, he's touching all kinds of people. She couldn't believe that because she's been told day after day, week after week, year after year that you can't be touched because you make people unclean. Who is this Jesus? He's touching people. He's touching unclean people. He's touching lepers. He's touching all kinds of people, touching blind men, and he's healing them. Um, for someone who's been very careful with hope, who's shut that away because it's too painful to even dare to imagine that she could be anything better than what she is, how would she unlock that part of herself? How long would it take, I wonder, for her to dare to hope that there may be some way out of this situation? The more she hears about Jesus, the more she wonders, can it be true? Can there, be, can there be someone out there who thinks that much of me that he could maybe touch me and maybe bring healing to me as well? Well, we know the story goes on and there is such a person. Do you know people in your experience who have been ostracised? Not even ostracised, but even people who have been neglected. Um, I've, I've visited some people already who are members of our church and who can't get to church. We hear about them. But um, have, you, have you met any of them recently? Have you gone to see them? Um, it's just a simple question because in my experience, I, I have not necessarily done that of my own bat, but as a pastor, I do. It could be because it's my job. It's a bit of indictment on me. But would I do it on my own time? I don't know. So visiting somebody who's stuck at home because of health reasons, whatever the reason might be, their ability to be touched by people is immediately slashed because at church, one of the joys of coming to church is we can interact with each other physically. But people who don't come to church don't have that experience. So do you have people in your experience who you know of, maybe church members, friends, family, who need to be seen, who need to be visited, who need to be touched? Um, what have we got here? Oh, yeah. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. Interesting story. Jesus is pushing through the crowd, he's trying to get to Jairus' daughter's house. And, um, and this lady touches him, but the funny thing is, you know, everyone's around him. I imagine the disciples are going, what, what are you, what, is this another joke of yours? I don't know. Another riddle? You're trying, because everyone's touching you. And everyone is touching Jesus. Everyone's pushing up against him. Anyone recognise this fellow? 
He's getting a bit old now. I think he's 28, which is really old. Anyone know who he is? Anyone willing to risk? There you go. That was quick. Who said that? Good one. You don't have a poster room, do you? Okay. That's Justin Bieber. Yeah. He's now 28, I think. I'm pretty sure he is. And he's married, so I don't know. Is his PL as great when he's married? I'm not sure. But um, all, the, all these, the, the large, I can't see any boys there, mainly girls, I think. But they're all trying to reach out and touch him. Why do you think they're trying to touch him? Well, you don't have to answer that. But maybe they want a, a souvenir, maybe they want to grab something. They just want to, they, maybe they just want to experience the, the idea that, yes, he's a real person. He's not just someone I see on TV. He's actually a real person. I want to touch him. I want to get excited by that. So they're all reaching their hands out, but this is the kind of situation I think Jesus was in. Everyone's touching, everyone's brushing up against him, everyone's pushing and jostling. He's going to Jairus' house. He's going to do something amazing. There's another miracle coming. Free entertainment, let's go. Everyone wants to be close to him because Jesus is like a celebrity. The thing is with these celebrities, how well do you know them? Now, for those of you who didn't know that previous guy, you might know this guy better. You know, I'm going to risk... Well, his name's up there, so gives it away. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> didn't think of that. Andre Rear, any, any fans? I'm willing to meet his... You know, I kind of like him, he's pretty cool. His sets are amazing. All the work they put into it, wow. But uh, I thought today, you know, there might not be so many young people here because of the youth rally. Maybe some of our slightly older people might recognise this guy. Yeah, I saw a picture of, of him dancing with, a, uh, with an, old, an old nun in the audience. He was literally just waltzing around with her. It was really cool. But I didn't manage to get the picture up here. So touch is, is important, but what kind of touch is it? Is it a touch of just brushing up against somebody? Or is it a touch of intention? Um, remember Lockie preached, I think, was it a couple of weeks ago? He was talking about uh, intention. Um, it's more important than, than what, um, what, what exactly we do. The, the intention of a heart is the most important thing in, any, in anything. The motivation of a heart is the most important thing. Advantages of touch. Touch is the primary way people relate and connect. Touch is the first of five senses that, human be- that humans develop in utero. You pro- I don't know if you've seen pictures of little, little uh, fetuses in the in the womb, they, they, they've got, their, they've got their, their fists, they've got their hand moving, they can, they can feel things, they can move it. Uh, touch has positive inf- effects on immune function, as we heard from our kid's story. Touch reduces pain. Touch enhances sleep, so you're less depressed or anxious. Touch improves cognitive function. Infant massage can help premature babies gain weight faster and leave the hospital earlier. So the premature babies are in the humidity groups, they'll, they'll put their hands in, the, um, in those glove things and they'll a massage them, it actually increases their ability to recover. Touch is now known to boost the immune system, lower blood pressure, decrease the level of stress hormones. And one, one really good example of how important it is to me is we've just line, lined ourselves up with a, a masseur. He's close, really close, like he's in the local shops just down the road from us. He's a Japanese masseur. And um, it's really interesting because he's, he's one who likes to converse. He, likes, he, he, he obviously gives good advice, but I can't pick up 70% of it because he isn't, his, Japanese, his Japanese accent is quite strong. I pick up enough to get, to get a gist of what he's saying, but he'll just, he'll just go on and he'll say, OK, OK, OK. I'm like, yeah, OK. But I don't get exactly what he's saying, but I stay there because what he does with his hands is, is amazing. Um, touch is a powerful healing thing. And you, won't, you probably won't recognize that until you don't have the ability to be touched for a while. Jesus showed compassion. Uh, Luke 8, 47, 48. When the woman realized she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fall to her knees in front of him. Sorry, I, I've gone a bit far. Sorry, let's go back to verse 46. Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. So we just, we just had a list of things which show that touch is important for, for, um, for healing. Now, have you, have, you, have you sensed this, like when you touch... Somebody maybe hold your wife's hand or, or, you, or you hug somebody you haven't seen for a long time. Um, you often feel that sense of, like that buzz, don't you? It's a, it's a literal physiological thing. It's not just a mental thing. It's a powerful connection you make. There is healing power in touch. And Jesus knows this. Luke gave us 47, 48. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. 
Now, that last part is delving a bit into words of affirmation, which I won't get too much into because we're going to look at that later. But Jesus has powerful words of affirmation for her. When the woman realised she... Let's go back again. When the woman realised she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. So Jesus calls her out. But when he calls her out, he doesn't condemn her. He doesn't put her on, put her on, on isolation and say, this is something you should not touch. He actually puts her there, gives her an opportunity to thank him, and he puts her back into her community again, puts her back into her family again. These are where these words are really powerful. He calls her daughter. Not just a nameless person, but a daughter. Back into family again. You're, you're my daughter. You're a daughter of Israel. You're, you're now connected to your family again. Your faith has made you well. Another word for faith is trust, which is a powerful word. Your trust in who I am has made you well. And the last words, which is most powerful of all, go in peace. Why is there peace? Because she's connected again. Jesus hasn't just been touched by her. He's now touched her back. And they're now a part of the family again. And that's the most powerful thing of all. How does God love? How do we love? Touch is one way. And if we could sum up the story of Jesus, again, why he came to this earth, when you look at the, book of John, the Gospel of John especially, it says very clearly that Jesus came to make God known. Um, John 1 is one of those powerful pictures where you've got, you've got John speaking against the Greek philosophy of the day. The Greek philosophy of the day said the logos, which is the word, is a big philosophical thing and we can't explain it, we can't understand it because they're philosophers, of course. Philosophers don't want us to understand anything, I don't think, sometimes. So the Logos is, is out there, it's, it's unobtainable, it's, it's, it's amazing, it's untouchable, basically is what they would say. And we try to pick bits of it, try to understand bits of it, but we can't really understand it all. John 1 comes, again, comes up against this and says, In the beginning was the Word, so far the Greek philosophers say, Yes, that's true. And the Word was with God, the Word was God. But then it goes on to say how, the, how this Word, which is unobtainable supposedly, comes to us and wraps itself in human flesh. And it says, it's not unattainable. In fact, the word came down to this earth in the form of a baby so that God could be made known to us again. God created us originally to love and to be loved. That's what he created us to do. And that's the powerful story of the gospel. Jesus came, wrapped himself in flesh, spent 30 years, which you don't know, don't know much about. I can't wait to find out what he did in all that time. In just three and a half years of his ministry, we find out a lot of what he did. He goes around touching people. I mean, how many times do you hear, do you read in the Bible, Jesus touching people, Jesus touching people. He even one person, he even got mud and put in his eyes. He got pretty involved. There's a point that they're trying to make here, that God is not unattainable. God is not untouchable. God is not out of, out of reach. God has come down and he's reached out to touch us. That's what he's about. Not just to make us feel good, but for us to know that we have a God who actually wants to connect with us. He wants to be our Father. He wants to be part of us. And that's why, of course, it says that God is now in us, effectively. He's not just out there, but he's actually part of us through his spirit, which is a powerful thing. So how can we love like this? Well, it's simply when you see in the New Testament, you see a picture of the church is often viewed as a body. You know, with Christ as the head, and you, you, you see how different people are like different parts of the body. That's a powerful image because you've got a body, but how does the body work unless it interacts with other bodies, of course? And this is one of the most powerful things about the gospel. That is the fact that we can touch each other in, in powerful ways. We can reach out, we can affirm each other in powerful ways as well. God came in human form, touched the world. God treats every human being as his precious child. And God calls us to go touch our world with his love as well. So I encourage you and invite you to explore that. Uh, again, not everyone is in the touchy-feely kind of thing, as they say. That's okay. If you, if you do the quiz and you, you see it is your, your, your primary love language, give it, explore it a bit. Talk to other people who have it as their love language as well and just share how you can do that because it is a powerful experience. Okay, we're going to have one more song and then prayer. Yeah, I'm finished. <laughs> Should we bring her up? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Pastor Matt.
Is there any strong individuals down there? Would you be able to put this down here? I'll pretend I'm strong. Oh, thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> Would you please stand with us? We're going to sing, and this song is a prayer. Build my life. Some of us, the whole touch thing is probably more of a natural thing, and some of us need to have some Holy Spirit prompting. So, Lord, please build our lives to reflect all these different ways that we can love people. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus in the name above every other
you so much that you are the firm foundation that we can build our lives on. We thank you for the way that Jesus modelled touch, the healing power of touch. And Lord, we want to honour you today. We want to connect with people. We want to love our families well. And Lord, I just pray that we can fill each other's love tanks through gentle touch, through kind touch. And Lord, we just thank you for your presence here today. Amen. We're so glad that you came to worship with us. Please take a seat. We're so glad you came to worship with us and that you're part of our family. If you were lonely when you walked in the doors, I hope you feel part of community. If you were hurting, I hope you found healing today. Next week on Saturday afternoon, there is Pathfinders, I believe. So that is happening next week. And then April 2, make sure you keep that in your diaries because on the evening of April 2nd, there is a special concert that will be raising money for the flood victims and all of the money raised will be going to ADRA. So that's something awesome that our church community is pulling together. For those of you who brought a picnic with you today, you are welcome to stay and join for lunch. And then next week, please bring a picnic along if you can and a little bit extra to share and we can just all hang out together and fellowship together. Down the front here to your left is the prayer corner. If there's someone you would like to pray for, if you need prayer yourself, if God's put something on your heart, we invite you to come down and we've got some of our prayer team here who'd love to pray with you. So thank you for being part of our family today, whether it was online or here in person, and we hope to see you again soon. God bless.